Well, good evening, everybody. Hello there. Welcome to the Academy's Morrison Planetarium and to this presentation in the Benjamin Dean Lecture Series. I'm Bing Kwok, Assistant Director of Morrison Planetarium. Uh, hello also to our uh, members and donors who are watching online via YouTube. Um, now, uh, this has been a really interesting and uh, exciting time for planet watchers. Um, I don't know if you had any opportunity with the weather the way it is right now to look at the sky, look toward the west to see Jupiter and Saturn. Anybody see that there? A couple? How many of you saw it tonight? Because, no, nah, not tonight, but, oh, tonight you did? Okay. Have you been watching those planets? Last week they were a half degree apart. That's the same apparent diameter as the moon. Tonight they're about ten times farther apart, but still very close together, close enough that you can see them both in the same field of view in a pair of binoculars. So it's a very pretty sight. I hope people don't miss it. So, so how many of you have seen those planets? together in the western sky just after sunset. Of how many have tried to see them? How many care? <laughs> okay, all right. I just want to make sure you're an astronomy-oriented audience here. All right. So, um, and the moon is beautiful tonight. It's almost full. It'll be full tomorrow night. It's what is sometimes referred to as a worm moon. You'll hear that in the media. That comes from the Algonquin language, and it refers to a time when the thawing of frost on the ground frees worms who've been trapped in their burrows, and so they're starting to appear in the ground. Uh, the next San Francisco Amateur Astronomer City Star Party at the Presidio Parade Grounds is on Sunday, March 26th, and that's a chance for you to meet up with amateur astronomers and look through their telescopes, which they love to show off to you. So uh, if you, if you want to drop in on them, that's on, uh, on the 26th. Now, coming up in the Dean Lecture Series, we've got some really exciting uh, talks coming up. The next three include um, Jennifer Blank on April 3rd. She comes to us from the Blue Marble Space, Science, uh, the Blue Marble Sci uh, Space Institute of Science, and she's going to be talking about exploring the caves of Mars with robots. On May 8th, astrophysicist Nia Imara from UC Santa Cruz is going to talk about the importance of understanding how stars come to be. And on June 12th, we'll have former astronaut Ed Liu from the Asteroid Institute presenting a case for a 4D system to map the asteroids. Now, these are uh, being posted on the lectures and we workshop section of the Academy's website. April and May are already posted, and uh, June is going to be posted later this week. And now to introduce tonight's speaker is the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization, Ryan Wyatt. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, who is part of our own Academy family. The first time I saw Dan Tell speak at a planetarium conference many years ago, I was very impressed and I was really overjoyed when he accepted a position here back in 2012. Uh, and for the last several years, he's been the manager of our planetarium engineering team. But he's also a great speaker who normally spends his time behind the scenes. And it was a unique opportunity to share this program with you. Dan was invited to present it at the Ars Electronica Festival in Linz, Austria last fall. And it was not a format that fit into kind of other things that we could do here at the Academy. So it's a perfect opportunity to highlight as a Dean Lecturer. So please welcome Dan Tell to present Searching for Planet B. This is my job. There we go. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Bing, for introducing me. Um, and yeah, as Ryan mentioned, normally I work here at the Academy. I'm part of this behind-the-scenes team that keeps the planetarium working. So if there's something wrong with the projectors, it is my fault a little bit, um, kind of entirely. Uh, uh, you know, Usually I work here along with uh, Matthew Wren, who's up in the booth piloting today, as our, well as our other members of the team. Uh, you know, we make the planetarium work, we keep it running, we keep it in good operation, but we're also the team that works with the researchers who come in to do things like our Dean Lectures uh, and take their raw data and turn it into something you can see and experience here in the planetarium. And something else you might not know about what we do here at the Morrison Planetarium is we don't just make things for ourselves. When we make our wonderful pre-rendered shows, like you might come and see during the daytime, we license those shows out to planetariums around the world, but also when we're adding this data into our software environment that we can free freely fly around in, we share this data with planetariums all around the world. That's actually what resulted in this invite out to the Ars Electronica Festival last year. 
Um, and so when it's invited out, uh, you know, they're really, really keen on the content that we made. Uh, and so the theme of the festival last year was Welcome to Planet B. And, you know, they were like, you know, it'd be great if you could do a presentation kind of like that ties into this theme. You don't have to. But I was watching the press conference where they were talking about what this theme was going to be and what it was about. And the, the CEO of the Institute was saying something really interesting, just like, we are at this unique point in history when we know we are damaging, we are harming the world. We know the world as it is right now is not sustainable. And so what does our future look like? Is there a planet B? Do we somehow survive in some sort of <laughs> wasteland landscape here on the Earth? Do we regenerate, regrow the Earth? Or do we escape and abandon it? Um, and you might notice the festival poster, it's probably impossible to read, but there's a little word bubble up there by this rocket going up that says, Jeff and Elon just left the planet. Because um, <laughs> we really, we're at this very strange point in history where people are talking as though we might leave the Earth and we might be able to abandon it and start a new life somewhere else. And of course, the whole word, the whole you know, idea of Planet B, uh, at least nearest I could find in researching it, uh, goes back exactly to where you probably recognize it from, the, environmental, the modern environmental movement of the 1970s and the classic slogan, there is no planet B. We have to take care of planet A, the planet we live on. But that's a 50-year-old slogan. Have things changed in those 50 years? Um, and you know, hearing that press conference, you're like, oh, well, that's the story of what our mission is here what our work is here. It's what I've been doing here in my entire time at the Academy. And so maybe this is a story that can unite a little bit of everything we've done here to tell a story about, is there a planet B out there that we can find and escape <laughs> the Earth to? Um, and so to tell that story, I actually want to take us back in time a little bit. Uh, take us back in time about 400 years ago, uh, early 1600s, um, and talk about a very famous astronomer, whose name you've probably heard if you come to other Dean lectures or in your general education, Johannes Kepler. Uh, and this was actually a great tie-in for Ars Electronica because uh, Kepler's final hometown in his life was Linz, Austria. So he's a little bit of a hometown hero. This is actually a picture of him. He's the dude in the back with the beard uh, from the cathedral in Linz. So he's, uh, he's honored enough to get to, get to be in the, the stained glass up in the church. Um, so Kepler lived at this really interesting time in astronomy, kind of this great revolution in thinking in astronomy. And he's a great character to emphasize because I think a big part of this whole story I have to tell is about rethinking and challenging assumptions. And that's exactly the kind of guy Kepler was. Because in Kepler's time, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. It was established fact for thousands of years. And in fact, the entire conception of the universe was based on the Earth being the center of things. Um, and I have to be careful not to get too in the weeds here. We actually did a whole play about Kepler here at the Planetarium about 10 years ago. Uh, we could talk about Kepler all day. Um, but I'll show you a little model of this view of the universe in Kepler's time. So this was kind of interpreted, uh, you know, kind of codified by the Greek philosopher Aristotle uh, a couple centuries before the Common Era. And it was the idea that the whole universe was just sorted by density. So there were four elements, earth, air, fire, water. The earth is the densest element, so it all fell down to the middle of the universe. And then water is the next dense, so it fell on top of the earth. Then the air on top of that. And even the idea that there was then a sphere of fire that we can't see surrounding the earth. And then beyond that, the whole rest of the universe was made of a fifth element called ether or quintessence. The stars, the planets, everything else in the universe was made out of crystallized ether. And of course, the Earth was the center. We could see these planets moving above us in the sky, so they must be moving around the Earth. This was established, accepted fact in Kepler's time. Now, this depiction of the universe like this isn't quite how Kepler's contemporaries would have believed it was. Uh, it wasn't just these simple circles around the Earth, because ancient astronomers had to explain the motion of the planets. In Kepler's time, and all of time before, there was no difference between the science of astronomy, the study of the sky, and astrology, the practice of using the motions of the sun, moon, and planets to try to predict the future. In fact, Kepler's job for much of his life was astrologer. <laughs> um, and so in order to like, understand this motion of the planets, people were tracking the planets very carefully for thousands of years. 
And a little bit uh, after Aristotle and his structure of the universe, um, another Roman astronomer, Ptolemy, Claudius Ptolemy, established to make this universe work, you actually don't need just these simple circles the planets move around on, but each planet is like a circle mounted on a circle spinning like a giant piece of clockwork. But that can explain how the whole universe moves. And in fact, Ptolemy's vision of this clockwork universe of spheres upon spheres all spinning around worked. Astrologers using Ptolemy's structure of the universe could accurately predict the motions of the planets. Now, they were always continuing to measure, continuing to refine those measurements, but this was the established fact of how the universe worked. And only a few people ever called it into question. The most famous of which was about 100 years before Kepler, Nicholas Copernicus, who was one of the first to propose that, hey, we know, and people had known for about 1,500 years, that the sun is way bigger than the Earth. So wouldn't it make sense for the big thing in space to be in the center and the Earth to move around that? So Copernicus proposed that maybe the planets move around the sun. He published a book about it, uh, got a little bit of no notoriety, the Pope like signed the foreword for it. But the problem with Copernicus's idea is it didn't work. He could not accurately predict the motions of the planets. And part of the problem there was Copernicus assumed the planets had to move in perfect circles because of course the universe was perfect. So if they weren't moving in perfect circles, what was the point of putting the sun in the middle? So his predictions didn't really work, his theory fell out of favor and things carried on under the assumptions of the Ptolemaic system, as we call it. In Kepler's time, though, Kepler got a little bit interested in Copernicus's work when he was studying. And interesting about Kepler, he really was a mathematician by his studies and at heart. And he wasn't just someone who believed that mathematics was a tool for describing the natural world. Kepler believed that mathematics was the language of God himself. And if you could understand the mathematical structure of the universe, you could know the mind and intent and vision of God for this world. And so he was very obsessed with finding not just the math to describe the world, but the math that was this underlying language he believed the world was built on. So Kepler began studying if there was a different way the universe could be made, a different way the solar system could work. Because this clockwork system seemed very arbitrary. He wondered if there were other laws that might govern the shape of the universe. And so when he was a young man teaching, he noticed a curious relationship between the orbits of Saturn and Jupiter. And he came up with this theory that perhaps the planets were moving around the sun, and in between the crystal spheres that each planet rode on, there was one of the five regular platonic solids. And we have a little visualization of that. Uh, he made a nice little uh, drawing of this in, in his book about it. But once again, the problem is, although a cool idea, the math didn't work. Because once again, to have this circular sphere for the planet with these regular polygons dividing each sphere, although a very cool idea for how to scaffold and build a universe, the math still didn't work. And Kepler was really good because he was a guy where even though he saw this didn't work within a few years of coming up with this idea, he still wanted to figure out, well, if this is wrong, what is the right answer? And he spent much of the rest of his life trying to figure that out, trying to explain the motion of the planets. And his research led him to what we now know is the answer. The planets do indeed move around the sun, but they don't move in perfect circles. Kepler, using the best observations of the time, realized that the planets move in ever so slightly stretched out circles. You can kind of see it on Mars if you look at it versus the orbit of the Earth. The planets move along elliptical paths. These circles are stretched out. And he derived from this observation then a whole suite of laws of planetary motion to explain how the universe moves. A couple decades after his death, the English astronomer uh, and physicist Isaac Newton took Kepler's laws and sort of found the generic form of them. He proposed that, you know, not just the sun and the earth had some attractive motive force behind them, but that all objects in the universe were attracted to all other objects, and from Kepler's laws derived his law of universal gravitation. And then another couple hundred years later, Albert Einstein helped us further understand what gravity really is. That gravity is not merely density of the universe, not merely an attractive force between objects. It is the, <laughs> the fact that mass and matter and energy, frankly, distort space and time itself. And so this great sort of a visualization as though you could collapse these four dimensions of space and time into a flat plane 
and see that where there is mass, like a star or a planet, it distorts space itself. It bends space and anything that travels through space. Through progressive questioning and study, we arrive closer and closer to a true understanding of what the universe is. And of course, even now, only in the last decade or so, we're even beginning to understand what mass itself actually is. We have much yet to discover. We're still always refining these models. But these models have helped to change our view of the entire universe. We've learned so much from them. And what's significant is all these things have played together over the last 30 years to help us discover planets around other stars. I, uh, early in my career, <laughs> I remember running an old planetarium show uh, that had a quote in it of, looking for a planet around another star is like looking for a firefly next to a, um, what do you call those things? <laughs> a, uh, um, you know, like, not, not a lamppost, but a uh, lighthouse, thank you. <laughs> I had it earlier today in rehearsal. Uh, it's like looking for a firefly next to a lighthouse from 100 miles away. Uh, it's that hard to see a planet next to a star. But about 30 years ago, scientists began to realize maybe we don't have to see the planet because we know planets have mass. They distort space and time around them, and a large planet will tug on its star as the star tugs. And so as they tug on each other, they will bend the light of the star a little bit redder, a little bit bluer. And so if you look for a, sh a star with this ever so subtly shifting color of light, you can't see it with your eyes, you need a specialized telescope, you might be able to see stars that have planets. And in the early 1990s, we did begin to discover planets around other stars just by this force of gravity. As time went on, we found a few planets like this, and we then came up with another way of finding planets called the transit method. In this method, if a star has a solar system around it, or stellar system, uh, that is perfectly in line with us here on Earth, as the planets of that system pass in front of the star, its brightness drops a little bit. We can measure that. And then using Kepler's laws, reconstruct the orbit, the size, and all kinds of details about those planets. We found a few planets of the transit system, and it was going so well, scientists decided to build a space telescope to find even more. They built a space telescope in uh, the mid-2000s, 2007, 2008, called Kepler, because it was going to use Kepler's laws to look for all these planets, figure out their orbits, and tell us more about it. And so if you look around, over the last 30 years, we have found over 5,000 planets. Now, this is the Kepler satellite. Its job was just to look at one spot of the sky right here. And just in this one spot of the sky, over the course of its multi-year mission, it found thousands of planets. It revolutionized our understanding of the universe. Because, of course, this is probably only 1% or less of the planets in this part of the sky, because these are only the stars where the planets are perfectly in line with our solar system, so we can see this transit. So we know a lot more about planets around other stars. And it really does open up this question. Is there another planet that could support life? Another planet that could support us, that we, we could move to, that we could live on, that we could escape all the mistakes we've made on Earth and go somewhere else? Let's take a look and find out. <laughs> so uh, pulling out into the universe, let's look at one specific star in that Kepler field, right there with that marker. This is a star called Kepler 186f. All these stars have just like catalog names. Um, so Kepler 186f, 186th star observed within the Kepler field of view, or uh, 186 is the star. Um, and it's actually, it's a stellar system of multiple planets. That f means it is the sixth planet out from its star. So if we spin around, because of course it was in line with us, see, hey, a whole bunch of planets, a solar system kind of like ours. And when we study other solar systems, one thing we often talk about is what we call their habitable zones. So the idea of a habitable zone is the distance from a star that a planet about the size of Earth with about the atmosphere of Earth would need to be to have liquid water on its surface. That's important because all life that we know of on Earth, which is the only place we know of with life, needs liquid water to survive. That's what we think is one of the essential ingredients that makes our planet habitable. So Kepler 186f was the first planet we had discovered that was about the same size of, as Earth in the habitable zone of its star. And this is a little depiction we made of it. Obviously, we don't really know what it looks like because taking a picture of a planet 
is still like taking a picture of a firefly next to a lighthouse from 100 miles away. But based on the data we have, we can make some assumptions about what a planet might be like and develop these visualizations we use in the planetarium. So way 6 f is only a little bit bigger than the Earth. It's towards the outer edge of its habitable zone. So it may be Earth-like, probably a little bit colder than the Earth. And that's kind of all we know about it. It's really far away. But what we do know about it is it goes around a type of star called a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are smaller stars than our sun, and they're a little bit more volatile. Just like our sun gets sunspots and solar flares, red dwarfs do too. But because they are much smaller, those sunspots and flares tend to be bigger and more dramatic. Because of that, they tend to spit out more radiation towards the planets go around them. They also, if they get a sunspot, could potentially cool down those planets around them too much. So we're not sure that red dwarfs are great host stars for habitable planets, but we have found a lot of them with Earth-like plants around it. Now the other planet problem with a planet like Kepler-186f, and this is going to keep coming up, it's really far away. It is hundreds of light years from Earth. That means light, the fastest thing in the universe, takes hundreds of years to reach our eyes from Kepler-186f. So it would take us thousands, if not millions of years to get there. Not a great place to go, not a great planet B. Let's uh, take a look at another Kepler planet. I'm going to jump us over to, or Matthew's going to jump us over to, this planet, Kepler 452b. So Kepler 186f, not necessarily a great planet because its star might not be a great star. Kepler 452b, though, was the next kind of cool discovery because it was the first time we found a planet about the same size as Earth in the habitable zone of its star around a star like the Sun. So a star that's hopefully a good star to live on. But Kepler 452b might still have some problems. It's about 40% bigger than the Earth. And we developed this visualization uh, for a lecture by Dr. Nick Cohen out of McGill University. He's a planetary geophysicist. And of course, Earth is the planet we know the most about the geophysics of. Uh, we know a little bit about Mars and Venus and the rest. And we know very little about exoplanets. And he's really interested in what we will eventually learn about exoplanets geophysics. Now, one of the things that he told us is, of course, Earth is the main example we have of a planet. And so if you just take all the stuff on Earth and you scale it up by 40%, what do you get? Well, you have more gravity. When you have more gravity, you can't build mountains that are the same height as on Earth. In fact, you can't even build continents that are as tall. Everything's a little bit flatter. And if you just scale up that amount of water that we have on Earth by 40%, well, you get a planet that's kind of just covered in water. Now, one caveat he does point out, we're not sure of this because we don't really know, like, oh, on a bigger planet, would more water get convected and subducted into the mantle? We don't know these things. But based on our guesses, if we just scale up what we do know, we have planets covered in water. The problem with this is if we want to find another planet to move to, our whole civilization kind of like lives on land. <laughs> we have like fire and electricity and technology that doesn't work so well in a planet-wide ocean. So even though a planet like Kepler 452b might be in a good spot relative to its star, not a great planet to set up as your new planet B. And once again, it's even further than 186f. So not a great candidate to go to. So let's start looking closer to our solar system. Let's uh, fly away from 452b, turn around, head towards home, I'm going to fly us to a really, really interesting star system. One that you may have heard about if you've been to a Dean lecture before, or just generally pay attention to astronomy news. It's been in the news a lot for the last several years. It's a star called TRAPPIST-1. TRAPPIST-1 is much closer than all the rest of these. It's only about 40 light years from Earth. So light from our sun takes 40 years to get to TRAPPIST. And TRAPPIST is really cool. At first, when we uh, first discovered the system, we found a couple planets in it. They're all Earth-sized, interesting. But about six years ago, almost seven years ago, actually, uh, follow-up observations of the system detected that it had seven planets in it. And what's cool about all seven of these planets, they're all about the same size as Earth. And in fact, three of them are in the habitable zone of the TRAPPIST system. So three Earth-sized planets around one star that could have liquid water on their surface. Really cool. We've done a lot of follow-up observations on TRAPPIST. We have used the Spitzer Space Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope to try and tell us more. Again, we can't take pictures of the planets, 
but we can measure their size. We can measure their mass using Newton and Einstein's work and Kepler's work. And so we can tell based on their density, based on their temperatures, that they're made out of some mix of water, rock, ice, and air, which is like all the things we need <laughs> to have like a livable planet. So uh, let's fly into one of these planets, uh, TRAPPIST-1e. And these are visualizations for the planets that were developed by Robert Hurt, who works with the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, so based on their obs observational data, based on what we can see these planets are made out of, based on the temperatures we know they are, he and his team worked on these visualizations for what these planets could look like. So again, they have some mix of water, rock, air, ice. These are planets that could support life. They're not too far away. And especially with three planets in the habitable zone, there could be three planets that could support life around Trappist, all about the size of Earth. So if you're going like, to look for another planet to move to, Trappist seems like it might be a pretty good system. But when we have such good habitable planets, one of the big questions we now have to face is, are they inhabited? Not even necessarily by intelligent species, although the SETI Institute, further down the peninsula, who we often work with, uh, is observing the Trappist planets to see if they can see any evidence of radio waves or laser communication between these planets, because it would be really easy to have a multi-planet civilization in the Trappist system. Uh, but even if there's just, you know, plants, bacteria, whatever, <laughs> some kind of life we can't even imagine, it starts to bring up the question, though, of, well, what right do we have to just move to someone else's planet? We're starting to like come to a place in our own society where we are reckoning with the evils of colonialism. So if we can recognize what we did on our own planet was wrong, what right do we have to repeat it on another planet, especially ones that seem so promising for potential life as the Trappist planets? And so Trappist might not be good. It's also still kind of far away. 40 light years might seem close, but that would still be thousands and thousands of years to travel. So is there any closer planet we could use? Well, so it happens, actually, the closest star to our sun has a planet around it. It has a planet that's about the same size as Earth. It has a planet in its habitable zone. This is Proxima Centauri b. So Proxima Centauri is the closest star to our solar system. It's only about four light years away. That's still pretty far, but people have come up with like proposals for a space mission that could maybe get there in a hundred or so years. It's a little more viable than anywhere else. The problem is Proxima Centauri is also a red dwarf. So it also has all these volatility issues of a red dwarf. We know it is a type we call a flare star that shoots out these big stellar flares. So it probably frequently hits this planet with big bursts of radiation. And then once again, although this planet is close, what right do we have to it? If it is habitable and potentially inhabited by some kind of life, what right do we have to it? Plus, even a hundred years to get to another planet, it would take a long time to move everybody off Earth to another planet, even one near this, this nearby relatively. So it's not a solution to our crises here on Earth. The climate crisis is happening now and getting worse now. We don't have the time to just get everyone to pack up and spend a few hundred years zipping over to the next solar system. So if the planets outside our solar system are not good planet Bs, what about inside? Let's uh, head over to our solar system. And so if we use the same mathematical formula for our solar system we use for these other ones to define their habitable zones, uh, we can fade up our solar system's version. And you might notice, so should we zoom in a little bit, that Earth is kind of on the inside edge of our habitable zone. Uh, and part of this is because Earth has volcanoes. Volcanoes release gases and particles that cool the atmosphere a little bit, and so we can be on the, the hot side of the zone and still okay. We live in the, the optimistic part of the zone, as we would call it in another system. There's another planet in our solar system that skirts the outside edge of our habitable zone, though, our neighbor planet Mars. Let's zoom in. See, Mars could be a viable planet B. It's certainly the planet that gets talked about the most as a potential planet B in our own solar system. As we come down on Mars, though, we can see we have really, really good data about Mars. Mars is not far away. We have studied it more than any planet other than the Earth. We have real pictures of it. We have real satellite data. We can build a really good model of it in the planetarium. Now, this is what we know it looks like now. 
But about 100, 150 years ago, when observers were first looking at Mars, when telescopes had gotten good enough, they thought they saw it looking a little bit different. They could see these light and dark areas on Mars. And so observers, like Percival Lowell, who uh, built Lowell Observatory near Flagstaff, Arizona, thought they could see these dark and light areas, but he also thought he could see lines crisscrossing the planet. Now, some of these were probably real features, like uh, you know, ancient riverbeds and canyons. Some of them may have just been the interplay of light and shadow, because some of them do follow the, uh, the high plateaus and things like that of Mars. But Percival Lowell, seeing what he thought he saw through the telescope, constructed this vision of Mars, not just as a habitable planet, but an inhabited planet, but also a planet that was facing its own climate crisis. Lowell believed that Mars was an older planet than the Earth. Civilization had begun there earlier, but now it was cooling off and slowly turning into a desert. And that intelligent but desperate Martians were digging enormous canals across their planet to siphon water out of their poles and bring it to their tropical oases and cities around the center of the planet. This vision of Mars was certainly evocative and inspirational, and it inspired a lot of scientific research for the following decades, um, and obviously a lot of science fiction too. But even shortly after Lowell's time, scientists were already questioning Lowell's ideas. We were measuring the atmosphere of Mars, and we could see it was very thin. It didn't have any oxygen in it. And so scientists were beginning to question, wait, how could anyone live on this planet? And the real nail in the coffin was when we first sent our robotic explorers to Mars in the 1960s. We saw no canals, we saw no cities, we saw no Martians. We just saw this giant planet-wide desert. Now, even though we see this giant planet-wide desert, there's still some really interesting things about Mars. We have measured the topography of Mars with our satellites. And so if we turn that on with a color coding, you can see, and I realize it's not this is, this is a NASA color code. This is not as good as we usually try and do it. But uh, these blue areas are the low-lying regions of Mars. And then it goes up to green, yellow, orange, red, and then white are the highest points of Mars. When we color code Mars this way, one thing you might notice is that between the low regions and the high regions, especially actually if we zip around to, oh yeah, over here, it would work too, um, there are what look like flows between the highlands and the lowlands. Places where it looks like, especially like here's a great example, where it looks like water carved canyons through the highlands of Mars down into the lowlands. And through investigations with our robotic explorers, both the orbiters and the rovers, we've actually come to learn now that, yeah, millions of years ago, Mars probably did have water on its surface. It probably did have a thicker atmosphere. It may have even supported an entire ocean of water in its northern hemisphere. Now, this doesn't mean it supported life and certainly didn't support a civilization of intelligent but desperate Martians. But over its first few billion years of existence, this once flooded Mars dried up. Its atmosphere got thinner and faded away. The water evaporated from the surface or froze underground. And Mars did become the desert we see today. We do know it still has some water frozen underground uh, and potentially even on very lucky days, maybe even leaks out as liquid water here and there on the planet. We're still investigating that. And this potentially means it could still support some kind of life. Obviously, we don't know if it ever had any kind of life on it, but it would probably be something very simple, just like bacteria or archaea. Uh, we're still investigating that. But this is the planet that's kind of the most like the Earth. But even so, it's not a good planet B. Now, this is the planet, certainly, that rich people here on Earth are talking about <laughs> moving to as their planet B. But it's still a planet where somehow to make it habitable, you would need to release this water that is frozen under the surface. You would need to build up an atmosphere on Mars again. You would need to add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere to warm it up. And while we're good at that, we'd, we're good at doing that here, <laughs> where we have lots of fossil fuels to burn. There's no fossil fuels to burn on Mars to make greenhouse gases. So although this is the probably most Earth-like planet, our best option, it's still not a good planet B. Now, there's one other kind of somewhat usable planet in the solar system. If we head to the other side of the Earth, we can visit our neighboring planet, Venus. Now, Venus obviously is way closer to the sun. It is inside, past the habitable zone. It gets a lot of solar radiation. But Venus is interesting 
because it is kind of this extreme example of the climate crisis we face here on Earth. While Mars has a thin atmosphere, Venus has a thick one. Somehow, early in its existence, a runaway greenhouse effect took place on Venus, possibly driven by volcanoes and other factors that caused Venus to build a thick, thick atmosphere of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, hopefully we all know, is a greenhouse gas. It favorably insulates heat from leaving the planet, so we all receive heat from the sun, hits the ground, bounces back up. Ideally, a lot of it radiates back into space, but when you have carbon dioxide, it just holds it back in on the planet. So Venus has this thick blanket of carbon dioxide covering the planet. And if we fade that away, we can see what it's done. It has left Venus a desert as well. There is no water on Venus. It is too hot. It is, in fact, over 900 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> it's hot enough to melt many of the low melting point metals. And the atmosphere is so thick, it has crushed the mountains of Venus. And so we find sort of a collapsed caldera features where the atmospheric pressure is so intense, you can't even build mountains anymore. Not a good planet to move to. A few people have talked about it, like, oh, well, if you throw a bunch of comets at Venus and build up enough water, you might be able to make it habitable. But there's nothing about Venus that we can fix more easily than we can fix the Earth itself. In fact, hopefully that's the theme we can look at as we've seen all of these planets. All of these planets are harder to make habitable than the Earth. And so that means the only planet B that we have as an option is the Earth itself. Now, we do face, obviously, a lot of challenges here on Earth. And so if we want to look at making the Earth itself our planet B, regenerating and restoring the Earth into a planet that can sustain life on it for millennia to come and even beyond, we need to look at what those challenges are and how to solve them. And I think what's really great about modern space science, about both our observations of these other planets, but also what we observe about the Earth from our satellites, is we can solve our problems. And to start looking at that, we're just floating over the Earth here, but I want to turn on one of my absolutely favorite data sets. So let's fade away that and bring up this data set called Black Marble. Black Marble is data gathered by a satellite called the Suomi NPP satellite, the National Polar Partnership Satellite. It's a joint mission between NASA, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, and the Department of Defense. And so it's a satellite, flies around the Earth every day, takes really nice pictures. It also takes pictures at night. And so this is a data set that's a compilation of nighttime pictures the satellite took over the course of about 10 days in 2013. And it's really amazing because it shows this human influence on the world. And I think especially when we talk about climate change and the climate crisis, it shows how we're doing that. All these lights that you see are the lights of our civilization. All these lights are electric lights, almost all of them. They are generated by the power plants all around the world, most of which burn fossil fuels. They burn coal, they burn oil, they burn natural gas. And when they burn them, those release carbon dioxide and other gases into the atmosphere that contribute to the greenhouse effect. Now, one thing I found over my career, when you talk to people who have questions about climate change, I don't want to call them climate skeptics per se, but just people who want more information to understand what's going on. A question I've seen a lot is like, okay, like this is, we're burning these things, they put carbon in the air, but where'd that carbon come from? So I'm gonna play a clip from our most recent show. It takes us back in time a few hundred million years, actually about 350 million years, to a time period we call the Carboniferous. We call it the Carboniferous because this is where all of our coal comes from. When plants with woody stems first evolved on Earth, we could call them the first trees, although they weren't really related to modern trees, nothing on Earth could decompose wood yet. So we're gonna fly down into a, uh, a carboniferous forest. So there were, whoop, pause quick, but uh, <laughs> we'll get in there. There were, uh, yeah, forests lining the, the shores of this ancient Earth and nothing that could decompose wood. So when the trees in these forests died, they just fell down into the swamps along the shores of this earth and piled up and piled up and piled up for millions of years, just old trees piling up with nowhere to go. Here we go. Um, and with nowhere to go, eventually, they sank into the earth and got buried. Deep in the earth, the heat and pressure of the earth 
cooked out all of the water and all the other impurities in the wood and turned it into coal. Now, trees, of course, build their bodies by sucking carbon dioxide out of the air. They use that to build sugars that they, they eat and to build the lignin and other components of wood in their bodies. So all the carbon that we are burning under the ground used to be in the air. Trees spent millions and millions of years taking it out of the air, and especially in the Carboniferous, just getting buried underground. That's the significant thing, I think, to understand when we were burning fossil fuels. Yes, the Earth did used to have more carbon dioxide in the air. Yes, it used to be hotter than it is now. But it took millions of years for trees to cool it down to what we now consider the habitable state. And yes, it has fluctuated. But when it fluctuates, it takes millions of years for these fluctuations to happen. In just the 200 years since the Industrial Revolution, we have burned a pretty good chunk of the coal and oil in the ground to power steam engines and trains and boats and up to our modern era of electric lights and airplanes and cars. About 70% of our greenhouse gas emissions are related to electricity generation and transportation. And we can really see that as we look at this map of the world. Everywhere you see lights is where electricity is being generated, mostly from fossil fuels. And it's kind of a measurement even of human development. If we were to spin back to Africa, we might see that even though Africa has a billion people living on its continent, it has very few lights. In fact, most lights we see here are around Nigeria, which is a big place where oil is being <laughs> extracted and mined. Uh, but you know, cities like Mogadishu, a city of two million people, are almost invisible. Whereas if we fly up to Europe or across to North America, we see masses of lights. We are the problem. We're the ones burning all these fossil fuels. And so we're the ones who need to do the work to fix it. Now, these maps just don't show us where we are burning fuels. They also show where we get them from. So if we fly across to America, I'll let Matthew get there however he thinks is best. I want to zoom us in so we can see all these cities, of course. But let's head to this spot right here. You might notice a little cluster of lights there. If you know your geography, you might know this is North Dakota. And there is no city the size of Chicago in Western North Dakota. These are the back end oil and gas fields in North Dakota. Our extraction of oil and gas is also visible in this map. And a big part of these lights, what we see, is actually from something called gas flaring. When we dig oil and natural gas out of the ground, we release some amount of natural gas, which is mostly methane, that we can't recapture. Methane is actually an even worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So if you can't recapture it, it's going to leak out into the air. The safest thing to do is just light it on fire. <laughs> because you light it on fire, it breaks apart the methane molecule, the carbon in the methane joins up with some oxygen, becomes carbon dioxide, the hydrogen either joins with oxygen too, becomes water vapor, or becomes hydrogen, just floats up into space. This is safer than just releasing the methane, but still not good. Just by mining oil and gas, we are releasing more greenhouse gases, let alone the downstream uses of it for transportation, for electricity. And a problem I certainly see with all of our proposals for how to mitigate climate change is they all just talk about slowing down how much we use fossil fuels. At the end of the day, we need to leave some of them in the ground. We need to switch to renewable resources before it's too late, before we run out of these resources and have nothing left to do. Now, another cool thing uh, where we're looking at this map when I talk to people about climate change, one of the other things I hear from people is, well, humans are so small. The Earth is so big. We can't really change the world. We can't really influence the world. We can't have these global effects. And one way I like to illustrate how big our changes are in the world are are these next data sets. These are data sets that come from the University of Minnesota and University of British Columbia. And these data sets, uh, you can actually browse them yourself on a website, earthstat.org our real testament to our influence on the world. These show what we could call the human agricultural biome. So you might know biomes, you know, like the tundra biome, the rainforest biome. They are you know, groups of ecosystems with similar types of life and similar niches in them. These areas show in green where we grow crops, and in orange where we pasture animals, mostly cattle. 30% of the land surface of the Earth is 
covered by the human agricultural biome. We have converted 30% of all land on this planet to feed us. And that's significant because of the agricultural parts, overwhelmingly, it is just three plants, corn or maize, rice and wheat. Every other plant you eat, all the vegetables, all the fruits, are kind of just like a rounding error. <laughs> Most of it is just those grains. So f all this amount of earth is covered with just a few different kinds of plants. And then again, these pasture lands overwhelmingly are beef cattle. There's a few goats, a few sheep here and there, but mostly cows are really big. They need a lot of land. So we converted a lot of the earth to be land for cows. This is one of our most significant impacts on the planet. We have taken all these natural environments and turned them into an environment that grows us food. Now this is significant because this really ties into how we make the earth a sustainable planet. Because one more data set I want to throw onto this is the amount of food we grow that we actually eat. So this is another data set from University of Minnesota, and uh, it was put together by Emily Cassidy, uh, who also worked here at the Academy after that, a uh, really cool person. She did this great research taking this data, and by looking at what exactly what kinds of crops are being grown, some of this is done through government reporting, some of it done through satellite data, because different kinds of crops reflect different wavelengths of light, so you can actually see what people are growing using satellites, uh, even without being able to take a picture of the corn cob. And so we can see how much of this cropland is actually being used to make food that we can eat. So everywhere you see blue, that is food for people to eat. Everywhere you see orange is something else. So like if you've ever been through the Midwest, I grew up there, uh, you might have, it's like all cornfields from here to there, and then there's a bunch of soybeans mixed in here. All that corn, all those soybeans, is not food for people. In some cases, it's food for animals. It is corn to be fed to cows. It is soybeans to be fed to pigs. Uh, you might even remember during the pandemic, there was a tofu shortage briefly. That's because there was more money in selling all the soybeans to pig food, not turning it into tofu. We are growing food for our, the food we eat. But not just that. About 30 years ago, you might remember, our government started subsidizing corn ethanol production to subsidize gasoline. So we are paying farmers to grow corn that we can ferment into ethanol and put into cars. We are feeding our cars with our cropland, especially this chunk. This is some of the most productive cropland on the whole earth, reason it to feed cows and to feed cars. And in fact, it wouldn't be worth the money if the government weren't paying for it. We're wasting valuable land on cars. <laughs> As I often say, like, the only ethanol we should make out of corn is whiskey. Um, <laughs> but this is important because, you know, often when people talk about the threat to sustainability on Earth, they sort of bring up the Malthusian crisis, this idea that, oh, population growth will outstrip our ability to feed the world. This has never happened. And in fact, when we look at all this data, all the crop data we have, all the pasturing data we have, we actually find out we waste a lot of food. We could probably grow about 30% more food on this planet, w just with the cropland we have now. We could feed 12 billion people on the Earth without having to cut down any more trees, without having to convert any more wild places into cropland or pasture land. We just need to use the land we already have, but we aren't. We can solve this problem. We can solve world hunger. We can solve world hunger for the next century, at which point we expect that human population will start to die down as uh, basically as people have higher standard of living, more access to reproductive health care, but we aren't. We're choosing not to. Some other examples of <laughs> where we're making kind of bad choices is we fly down to Brazil. And let's actually take away both this data set and black marble. Uh, pay attention to these patches right here a little bit. And we're going to fade away the night side at layer. Oh yeah, I might need to turn the, the earth side off totally. Whoop. When we talk about things like, you know, the Amazon burning, which of course we've had major issues with the last few years, uh, especially under the Bolsonaro administration, when the Amazon is being deforested, it is being deforested for food. So these are some of the most affected areas, the province of Rondonia in the Amazon, for example. This is a major area of the Amazon that's been cut down. 
What is being cut down for? It is for agriculture, but not to grow crops. It is mostly for cattle pasture land. Probably one of the biggest environmental problems we have is our hunger for beef. Agriculture as a whole results in about 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So everything that is not energy production or transportation is pretty much agriculture. And half of that, 15% of all of our emissions, is cattle. So cows, of course, they eat grasses and other things. And to digest them, they ferment them in their multiple stomachs. As they ferment plant matter, they burp. Their burps are made of methane, which, as I mentioned, is a worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So just cow burps from the billion cows on this planet are 15% of our greenhouse gas emissions. That means one of the biggest ways we can have a positive effect on climate change is just to eat less beef, and especially eat less cheap beef. Because that's what the Amazon is being cut down for, is to make pasture land for inexpensive beef to fuel the world's hunger for cheap cow meat. So I'm not saying you, don't, you can never eat beef. It, just, it should probably be expensive. You probably want to make sure it's beef that is actually raised as part of regenerative agriculture. Because, of course, cows are part of the natural world. They were native to Europe, and in the Americas, we can use them to replace where we wiped out all the bison. They can fill that same ecological niche. So we can use them for forms of regenerative, sustainable agriculture, but cutting down the Amazon to grow cheap beef, not sustainable, not a good part of the future of our planet. Now, the last couple of data sets I want to look at aren't just about how we get our food, but about one other crisis that faces our planet. Just like astronomers 100 years ago looked at Mars, saw this desert world desperately trying to pull water down from the poles to keep its civilization alive, so too do we face water crises here on Earth. I mean, we're here in California. We're no strangers to drought. Um, and, you know, in fact, when you talk to the researchers who really work on the drought, one of the things they will point out is we call it a drought because we kind of don't know what else to call it. This is not a drought. This is not something that will end. This is the permanent status of California from here on out. We will have years like this year where we have an outrageous amount of rain in one year, but we're not going to have the sustainable regular rainfall that California had when we settled it. California and much of the American West is desertifying. We are losing water and is not being replenished the same as it once was. Now, this blue data set is water use. And one of the significant things about water use, about 70% of all the water we use is used for agriculture. It's used to grow food. About 20% is then industrial, and about 10%, all that's left, is residential. Part of what this means, of course, we all need to do our part, but taking a shorter shower is not going to help the water crisis. We need to look at how to reform agriculture. And in places in the world where there are already water shortages, places like Israel, where they really don't have access to water outside of the state of Israel, they have to rely on drip irrigation and other technologies to make sure they're using what water they do have efficiently. Because kind of the problem is where we have water, we use it. Now, one data set I want to add on top of this, though, is sort of showing the future of this water crisis. We have a couple of satellites orbiting around the Earth called the GRACE mission. The GRACE mission measures the gravity of the Earth. Now, the Earth's gravity is not uniform. It's ever so slightly different in all the different places of the Earth. Sometimes this is because of there's taller mountains, so there's more mass there. Sometimes even because a meteor hit that part of the Earth and put a big chunk of iron under the ground years ago. In this case, what we're looking at here specifically is where the Earth's gravity changed over the course of the GRACE mission. So this is the change over the 10 or so years of the mission. How does the gravity change? It means that part of the Earth lost mass. How did it lose mass? Well, it's not from mining. <laughs> we don't dig up that much dirt. Everywhere we see these orange and white highlights showing us where we lost mass, it's because of water leaving that part of the Earth. Now, there is, of course, the water isn't you know, just disappearing into space. <laughs> there is water gaining, mostly in the oceans. So fresh water, of course, flows into the oceans, becomes part of the salty mix of the salt water, and then we can't use it without a really energy-intensive process. But what we're seeing is a lot of places in the Earth, a lot of places where we need water, are losing it. And I think significantly, especially if we fly back over just north of India, we have the Himalaya Mountains. And we can see this big orange patch here. The Himalayas have lost a lot of mass. 
not just in the last decade, but over the last century. The Himalayas, of course, are the highest mountains on the earth. They are covered in snow and glaciers and ice. And historically, every winter, there's lots of rains. They turn to snow in the mountains. They build back up these glaciers and ice caps on the mountains. And those ice and snow slowly melt over the spring, summer, and fall and fuel all the rivers to India, Southeast Asia, and China. About half of the people in the world rely on water from these mountains. But because of climate change, it's not snowing and raining as much. It's not as cold in these mountains in the winter. And so that bank of snow and ice that we draw from for water for the rest of the year is not replenishing as much. It's not a problem right now, but over the next century, less and less water will begin to flow out of the Himalaya. And there's a good chance by the year 2100, half of the people in this planet, who all live right here, <laughs> half the world lives here, are going to be suffering a huge water crisis. We can see the same thing, too, if we fly back over to California, of course. As we know, the same thing is happening here. Snow and ice that used to build up in the Sierra and Rocky Mountains every winter and become our bank of water to draw from through the spring, summer, and fall are not building up at the same rate that they used to. There's less and less water in the American West. And the only solutions, really, are we need policy solutions. We know what the problems are. We know we can fix them by enforcing better policies around water use, especially agricultural water use, especially things like, <laughs> you know, the cities of Phoenix and Los Angeles having golf courses in them. Uh, there are things we can do to reduce our water use to make sure we are drawing at a sustainable rate for what is, frankly, the new normal of our planet. So I want to bring all these things together to make the point. These big crises we face on our planet, greenhouse gas emissions, conversion of natural lands to agricultural purposes and the greenhouse gas emissions that result from that, and water crises, these are the things that are going to make our planet uninhabitable. But these are all things that we, because we know what the problem is, we can actually solve them. We can solve them through decisive action, through policy changes, and through human innovation. We can restore and regenerate our world back to a sustainable shape. We can stop pumping greenhouse gases into the air. We can plant, rewild some of that agricultural land we've converted. Let trees grow there again. <laughs> Let them suck some of that carbon dioxide back out of the air. We can more sustainably use and harvest water so we are not depleting it at an unsustainable rate. We can make this Earth a sustainable, habitable, regenerated planet B that we can all live on for centuries, but we have to take that action now. We know what we need to do. We have all this data, all these pieces of the puzzle. We just need to do it. We don't all need to do everything, but everybody needs to do something to make our world the real planet B. And that's my story for the night. Well, thank you, Dan. And we do have time for Q&A. So if you have a question, if you could raise your hand, uh, Bing or I will come and bring you a microphone so that everyone can hear your question. And it looks like we have our first one from near the center of the audience. Thank you for a lovely presentation. Uh, a lot of the information was new for me, and I was glad to hear it. I'm just wondering why there's so much resistance to the plans that Pro Project Drawdown has come up with to relieve all these issues that you talked about. Um, the, yeah. Um, I mean, fundamentally, I think the reasons for resistance are complicated. I think one of them is life is comfortable now. Obviously, as the crisis <laughs> the climate crisis is getting worse, it is getting more and more uncomfortable in more places in the world. But for people, especially the people who have the money and have the power, things are very comfortable. They don't need it to change. And I think what's interesting, of course, if you look at who the biggest investors are in renewable energy and resources, it is the fossil fuel companies. They see this is the future. They know this is the future. But it's still profitable to dig all these things out of the ground and keep burning fossil fuels and keep things going as they are. And that's really where, yeah, we as citizens need to stand up and call on our policymakers to make the right choices and force the right policies to help put these policies into place so that we do start sustaining the world before we push it right to the brink. 
Yeah, well, that's the problem. How do right. we get these people to react? Or actually, we don't want them to react. We want them to respond in a wholesome way and not throw it off to other people. Yeah, and I think right. The key thing is, you know, we have to use our power as voters. We have to we have to call our legislators to respond to us as voters to try to heal the world. Um, because yeah, we frankly, other than our own personal actions, we don't have that much power. And when corporations are the biggest ones causing these changes, the only power that is held is by our legislature leaders. So that's where we need to focus our energies. I believe these are policy problems. They have policy solutions. We need to make our policymakers put those policies into place. Thank you. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, of of these planet bees, um, I like the Trappist system. It's really cool. Uh, so we, we got to see the Trappist planets. That was like a really cool project we got to work on with Spitzer Space Telescope Science Institute of getting the, that that data into our software. We also gave them back the sky maps from the Trappist system to make their visualizations. Um, so yeah, I like it. I just wouldn't want to move there. <laughs> so we have another question from the sixth row here. Um, how long have we got if nothing changes? That's a good question. I think no one really <laughs> has a good answer to that. Um, I think there's a lot of data that points to the year 2100. Things are going to be really bad then if we don't do anything. Because obviously we are living now in the climate crisis. I remember when I started here 10 years ago, we were already talking about like, oh yeah, things are going to get bad in about 10 years. And that's happening. <laughs> we're seeing record wildfires, w record droughts, record storms all over the world. So we're already in the middle of the beginning of the climate crisis, and it's only going to keep getting worse. As for how long humans and human civilization can last, well, we know we're resourceful. We know we can stick it out through a lot. So it's hard to like be like, oh yeah, things are going to end in 2100 if we don't do anything. But things can just keep getting worse for a long time for a lot of people. So we don't really know what the timeline is, but the sooner we can take action, the better, especially because it takes a while for that carbon to heat the Earth up. So even if we stopped burning greenhouse gases today, we're still going to pass the <laughs> those, those benchmarks for how hot we wor want the Earth to get because that carbon is still sitting in the air. So we need to really take some drastic measures to keep the Earth comfortable and sustainable now. Do we have any more questions? Oh, right here. Yeah, what are your thoughts on nuclear energy instead of burning fossil fuels as a uh, kind of zero emissions uh, technology, especially with the near technologies that are coming out in that area? Yeah, and so I think one thing to keep in mind with nuclear energy, uh, you know, there are people on both sides of, you know, and I, I think like Chernobyl and Three Mile Island obviously like really set back the nuclear power movement. One thing to keep in mind with nuclear energy is uranium itself is not a renewable resource. There is a limited amount of extractable uranium on the surface of the Earth. And we only have about enough uranium for nuclear power to power our whole civilization for a century or so. So nuclear power is a bridge to something else, but it's not the complete solution to everything. What I do think is exciting, obviously, like <laughs> we know solar works great. We're putting solar panels in everywhere. That's a really great sustainable solution. We know wind power is great. Even things like tide power have a big potential in the future. And I think you know, some of the most exciting research projects are fusion power. You know, the National Ignition Facility just over the hill uh, achieved their first positive energy reaction. The joint European Taurus in Europe is approaching their, you know, turning on their fusion reactors. So if we ever get to the point of workable, sustainable fusion energy, that's the real game changer. That's what's going to give us basically unlimited energy with no greenhouse gases. But we are decades away from real fusion power. So yes, we need to use the bridges we have in the time, but other energy sources are not the final solution to getting us all the way to solving the fossil fuel crisis. Well, I'm not seeing any hands, so I'll, maybe I'll ask a question. If, um, so I, I'm, I'm guessing, because I already know the answer, <laughs> That you uh, that uh, visualization plays a key role in sort of communicating these challenges. What are some of the ways that we can visualize solutions? Because I think a lot of the data that you presented show the challenges. But what are some ideas for how we can visualize? Yeah, 
uh, ways out of it. I, and I think the great answer to that question, I think what we, I, I hope we will be working on here at the Academy in the next several years is envisioning what a comfortable life will look like in a future <laughs> where, where we employ these solutions. Because I think it's very easy to be afraid that we're gonna just take away all the things that make our life comfortable now. We gotta turn off all the electricity, we gotta stop driving cars, we gotta stop eating beef, we gotta stop drinking water, but that's not necessarily what the future is gonna be like. We, <laughs> we need to see what the options are gonna be to live a happy, sustainable future. Uh, one of the great things about being at Ars Electronic and Linz is they have a really great program they put together there called Welcome to Planet B. Um, Planet B theme comes up a lot. Um, and it's, it's a really great program where the audience gets to make these choices about what they want the world to be like in the future, what choices they want to make in the future, and it shows them a vision of that future. And it's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of choices we can make, like building more sustainable cities, investing more in public transit, careful electrification with non-fossil fuel sources that will give us a regenerated, happy, comfortable planet. You know, we, there's enough food, there's enough water for everybody, we just have to move it around in the right way. And so I think, yeah, for institutions like us at the California Academy of Sciences and others, it is helping to envision this future where we have made these choices to make a more sustainable world, to regenerate the world, and show people you will still have a comfortable standard of living. It will still be a nice world to live in, uh, not just from the environmental perspective, but from our human creature comforts. We won't have to give up as much as we think we do if we act soon enough. Well, if there are not any more questions, that seems like a great thought to end on. So I want to thank our speaker, Dan Tell, once again. <laughs> if you had any questions that you were afraid to ask in front of everyone else, please feel free to come down and talk to Dan. Uh, otherwise, you can exit either the top of the dome or down at the bottom. And thank you again for coming out to the Academy this evening.